G'day all and welcome back to another Fix It Fingers Fiver. The segment where I take a beginner's woodworking topic and give you five tips and or tricks to help make your life a little bit easier when dealing with it. Today we have melamine, probably my least favorite material to work with, but a very important one because if you do any DIY work, you're gonna run into this stuff. So what is it? Basically speaking, melamine is a plastic coated particle board, which you're gonna see in every single kitchen, bathroom and laundry pretty much in existence. So if you're working around your house or like me, you're doing handyman jobs, you're gonna to have to learn how to deal with this stuff because it has a few idiosyncrasies which make cutting it, drilling it, working with it different to if you were using even plywood or real timber. So I've got a whole bunch of stuff on the table here which you might wanna consider. Let's see how it's gonna help you out. Alrighty, step one is of course cutting. We can't do much with this if we can't cut it and there is a problem. Look at that edge. I cut that with a regular saw and that thin plastic on the outside has the nastiest habit of chipping out consistently. Best case scenario, you have a really sharp, really high tooth blade. But if like me, you just got a regular old circular saw with a fairly standard blade in it, there are a few things we can do to avoid the worst of the chip out. Blue tape is number one. You'll notice the blade rotation is kicking upwards, which means that edge on the top side of your cut is the one that's gonna be pulled away from the substrate and therefore get the chip out. The bottom should be pretty good. You shouldn't have to tape it, but you can if you want. One way of helping to deal with this is to do a scribing cut. Set the depth of your blade very, very shallow and then run that shallow cut first before coming back, resetting the depth of your saw and making your follow-up cut. Do a bit of a test. If you find the blue tape helps with a regular full cut, then you can just do that straight off the bat. If not, the scribe may assist. Bonus little cutting tip. This is a piece of standard insulating foam and it is great for supporting your longer cuts. However, melamine is very slippery. So if you're gonna use some sort of edge guide like my Craig AccuCut here in order to do your long rip cuts, you'll probably find you'll need some track clamps because the anti-skid mats on the bottom aren't gonna hold onto this very slippery plastic surface. The other advantage of using a track saw like device is that the chip guard on the outside is again going to help reduce that tear out that you can get on the top of your cuts. I still tend to use the blue tape, but you could do another test and see if your chip guard's good enough, you may be able to eliminate having to tape up every single edge. Set the blade depth just below the thickness of your material and you should have happy days on both sides. No matter if you're using a circular saw, track saw, jigsaw, table saw, miter saw, or even a router, blue tape is my number one tip for working with melamine as it will minimize that nasty chip out which can look very shoddy on the edges of the boards. Get yourself some. Okie dokie, here's my second tip. This is probably one of the hardest things of dealing with melamine is drilling holes. I've just spent a few minutes trying to drill really nice holes using a variety of things. I've used the Brad Point bit, which some people recommend. That's nearly brand new too. That's a good quality one as well. I've used my regular bits with and without the countersink on there. And I have used a normal larger size drill bit. And as you can see, the results are universally terrible, except for a few. Even the blue tape doesn't help really. I got one good one out of it, but the rest of them, well, if you were drilling heaps of holes, you're gonna be stuck, aren't you? Well, firstly, marking holes accurately. If I want a hole specifically right there, then the first thing you wanna do is to use your awl in order to give your drill a place to start. That'll be very important if accuracy is your goal. But regardless of drilling fast, drilling slow, which bit you're using, a sharp bit is gonna help, but let's face it, not many of us have ultra sharp bits. And drilling a regular hole, you're nearly always gonna end out with chip out, and that can be highly annoying. One way to deal with it, of course, is to get those little circular white patches and stick them over the top. That's what's gonna be done a lot of the time. But there is one more cheeky trick we can do to turn this into this. Look at that nice clean edge. One simple button, that one. Put your drill into reverse with a larger drill bit, countersinking size, compared to the one that you have got your hole done. Ah! 
Running in reverse, the drill will not tear out the melamine and you can clean up all of this rubbish. Then when you get your screw in there, happy days. If you're lucky enough to have a set of countersinking bits such as this one, they can help. I do get reasonably good results, but sometimes not so much. Again, before you get down to the full width, switch it into reverse. And you can clean up any of this sort of rubbish. It all depends on how fussy you want to be. A lot of the time these holes are not going to be seen. And of course having a good backer will help to prevent blowout at the back. But honestly, I don't think there's a lot you can do to stop this sort of thing happening. That one's not too bad. Blowout is always going to occur. So make sure you consider that if you've got a screw hole coming all the way through a piece of melamine, you're going to want to have something clamped onto it every time. If you're working with melamine, there's an excellent chance you're also going to be working with cabinet hardware. I have shelf pins, I have a standard door handle for a wardrobe or a drawer, and I have a fairly standard cup style hinge. Luckily, there are some jigs, which are not essential. You can do it completely without any of these, but I like them, particularly if you're going to do a lot of hardware work and you want it to be repeatable. This one is the hardware jig. When you get your handle, it will usually tell you what that spacing is. In my case, it is 96 millimeters. And I've decided to set the jig about an inch and a half from the edge or 35-ish mil. I set my drill guides to 96 mil, which is that size. And I've marked my center line for my drawer, door, whatever you want to call it. And it simply lines up like that. Two holes. Now you'll notice this does drill quite a nice clean hole because the drill guides are holding down that plastic. Uh, let's not look at the other side. I really should have had a backing board, but this is for demonstrative purposes. And hopefully, as long as I've measured this up correctly, those should perfectly line up to those every time and if you're doing many many doors then you're going to have it the same spacing every single time good jig that one shelf pins this comes with its own special bit if i want to have adjustable shelving that's where this guy comes in if this is the edge of my cabinet Again, fairly nice clean holes because of the drill guides. And next you would go to the other side of the cabinet and drill them in the same way. That way you can put these guys in at various heights and set your shelves to whatever spacing you need it. This is probably the most used one for all of my cabinets in the garage here. Last but not least, hinges. This one's a little bit more complicated. When you buy your hinges, they will have the mounting instructions for them, and this jig will handle the vast majority thereof. I have set these to four millimeters because that's what my packet says. It also comes with this handy force the bit on a stop collar. Once that's on the drill, it locks in. You'd have your mark of where you want your hinge. In the real world, we clamp these down. Again, really nice clean hole because of the way that the jig operates. And your hinge cup is now perfectly positioned. Ooh, tip soft close. Drill, drill. Away you go. And of course, like all Craig gear, it's available at Carbotech here in Australia. I've got my affiliate links down below because they support this channel and the Amazon links for people overseas to pick these up. They are very handy. They'll pay for themselves in save time if you're going to be doing a set of cabinets also. If you're just doing one, you don't really need them, but I do like having them on hand.
Tip four for Metamine is edge banding. This is probably the most daunting step if you haven't done it before, but really it is very straightforward and in any DIY workshop, you've probably got all you need to do this with one exception. Start by sanding down the edges. I just use 320 grit, something very light to smooth them off. Then pop into your laundry room and grab your iron. Crank it up to its highest heat, the cotton setting usually, and turn off the steam because we are going to iron on this edge banding, but you need to do it on those settings. Before you return to the shop, stop by the kitchen and pull out the greaseproof paper or the baking paper. Make sure you keep your piece of baking paper between the hot iron and the edge banding, otherwise it'll stick to the iron, you'll melt the edge banding and you'll be starting all over again after a nasty bit of cleanup. Cut a piece just longer than the length that you need, overhang it on both sides and the ends. Start at one end, hold it nice and straight and stick it down for a second or two and then run the iron backwards and forwards until the banding is pretty much just too hot to touch with your finger. That should mean the glue is melted and you're ready to grab a rounded stick, a dowel, anything with a gentle edge on it and use pressure to push that edge banding firmly into the particle board. Really work the edges and the ends of the strip to ensure good adhesion. To remove those overhangs, you can buy some fancy tools. If you're doing a lot of this, they might be worth the investment. Me, I've just always gone straight to a sharp chisel. Keep your fingers behind the blade. Make sure you're pushing towards the center of the mass. And with a bit of practice, you should be able to get off those edges in one beautiful long curly strip. Three twenty again, just on the edges and that'll smooth off any sharp bits. Flip it over and do it again. I was working horizontally there and that can be done, but ideally, if possible, try and get your piece mounted vertically in a vise or in your table clamped up and that will make your life a lot easier, particularly when doing very long pieces of edge banding. You have to work quickly, but there's no super rush if it cools off too much, you can just hit it with the iron again and remelt that glue. Last but not least, tip five is white spirits or methylated spirits as we call it here for cleaning purposes. White melamine is by far the most common thing and it will get dirty, dusty and otherwise looking a bit crap. And particularly if you're doing this work for a significant other or for a client, having a bottle of spirits on hand to clean it off afterwards will ensure a professional looking finish. That's it for this Fix It Fingers Fiverr. There are affiliate links if you want to help out the channel to a lot of the things that I mentioned today that will help to cut, drill, and install your melamine cabinetry.